So I'm not going to be talking about nuclear fission today. That didn't seem all that interesting to me. Um, but I will talk about something that might be a little bit more interesting. So quick question. How many of you have a smartphone? Just show of hands. All right, so a lot of you. What about a tablet? OK, fair number. So as you can see, mobile technology is everywhere. We use our smartphones to take pictures and to listen to music. We use our tablets to watch movies and read the news, and our laptops for just about everything else. They allow us to stay connected with one another, regardless of geographical boundaries. And they're involved in just about every aspect of our day-to-day -day lives, all except what may be two of the most important, our health and our food. Even now, in the 21st century, in order to get access, a basic diagnosis, you need to call the doctor's office, drive all the way to the office, wait in the waiting room for what seems like forever, only to be taken back and to be told that you have to eat more, drink more fluids and get more rest. And on top of that, you're billed for it. But we have to keep doing this because we really have no other option. Unless, I guess you might consider WebMD to be an option, but Every time I use WebMD, I'm told I'm dying of a new disease. <laughs> so I don't really like that too much. So how can mobile technology solve this problem? Well, mobile technology empowers the patient in a system where currently only the doctor is empowered. You, the patient, can input your symptoms and talk to a doctor when you want. And while the doctor is getting a diagnosis back to you, you can continue on with your life. The era of driving to a doctor's office and waiting for waiting in the waiting room is slowly dying. And after all, if everything from shopping to banking is already online, why not healthcare? This lack of patient empowerment became especially evident to me about three years ago. This is my grandfather. Three years ago, he fell ill. And he lived in a small rural village with my grandmother in India. Now, this village had no healthcare, and the closest hospital was about uh, about two hours away, and he had to make this trek at least twice a month, and many times even more. Now, the worst part about this was he would usually be at the hospital for just an hour, but he would be commuting for over four hours. I just thought that was ridiculous. So I, I heard about this, and I started talking to my friend Vikram Maroon about it, and a couple months later, and after some more discussion, we started Dr. On, a telemedicine company. And at first, we wanted to be able to do everything from the get-go. We wanted to be able to diagnose everything. It was going to be a telemedicine, it was going to be a smartphone tablet app that would allow you to video conference with the doctor closest to you. But we soon realized that wasn't actually going to work out that well, and so we decided to shift gears a little bit. We decided to focus on one thing, ophthalmology, and we did. So we decided to te uh, field test in India, the home of the world's largest blind population. And after we kept looking at it, we realized that developing countries is what needs us the most. Apparently, there's over 80% of all visual uh, impairments and uh, blindness could have been prevented in developing countries if they just had access to healthcare. So if we think about this for a second, that means that there are 230 million people worldwide in developing countries that are walking around blind simply because they didn't have access to the healthcare when they needed it. Not even that they couldn't afford it, it's just that they couldn't have access to it. Vikram and I immediately decided that this was going to be Dr. On's first goal and first product. We were going to provide a method to allow these patients to have access to the ophthalmic care that they needed. In order to do this, we knew that we had to embrace the power of mobile technology. In India, like many other developing countries, they jumped straight into the cell phone bubble. It's estimated that there are right now 865 million cell phones for a population of 1.2 billion people. And there's approximately 500,000 new lines signed daily. Next year, they're saying that there's going to be a 97% prevalence of cell phones in India. So we knew we had to use cell phones. So while we're brainstorming how to bridge this gap between ophthalmology and mobile technology, we decided to take a look at how, how you're diagnosed today. So if you go into an eye hospital today, you're go they're going to do four basic tests to you. First, they're going to do a visual test, so just to see how your vision is. Then they're going to do a slit lamp. This is a slit lamp image. So it looks at the front of your eye for, cataract for cataracts and other lens, uh, lens disabilities. 
Then you do, you do a fundus image, which looks at the back of the eye or the retina. And finally, they, they look at the external image. So Vikram and I were looking at this and we're like, okay, let's start with the slit lamp. Let's see if we can recreate this with our cell phone. And so after three years of testing and a lot of help from the Columbia Career Center and the public school district, uh, we were able to uh, create a device that provides 92% accuracy compared to face-to-face -face diagnosis. And the best thing about this, it costs less than $10. It diagnosed cataracts, the world's leading cause of blindness, and the only other current way to do that is with a $3,000 plus machine. Now numbers sound great, but the real thing that appealed to us was making sure that all these patients got access to the care that they needed. And so on our first visit to Shankar Nathralia, the eye hospital that we teamed up with, uh, Vikram and I experienced something that stuck with us for a very long time after. This image is rather graphic, so please close your eyes if you're easily disturbed. Meet baby Romke. I met him when he was 12 days old, and he was suffering from a disease known as proptosis. His, he, came, he comes from a very poor family, and his mother had to bring him to Shankarnathralia via train. Once he got to Shankarnathralia, they immediately took him to a, a checkup room, and they gave him a thorough checkup. He was then taken to an operating room, and they operated on him. Luckily, he got to keep his eye, but I later learned that if his mother had delayed by even another couple of minutes, he would not have been so lucky. That really stuck with me. I, I just could not help but think about how many other small babies there were around the world, not only in developing countries, but in rural parts of developed countries that were blind or were about to go blind simply because they didn't have the access to the healthcare that they needed. So, Ophthalmology was, cases like Romke is what keeps us going forward. We know that in countries like India, access to ophthalmic care is a necessity, not a luxury. But ophthalmology is just the beginning for us. There's a huge field of medicine on top of that. And not only medicine, mobile technology has the power to make all of our lives for the better. You can, we can have kiosks set up in gas stations, grocery stores, and bus stations. So everyone in, devel in developing countries as well as rural parts of developed countries can go to these to get their basic diagnosis. We hope that one day, the only time you need to go to a hospital is for intensive care or extensive testing. Everything else can be taken care of in a kiosk like this. Medicine, it's not even, it doesn't even have to stop at medicine. Last summer, Vikram and I went to an agricultural college in India. The government there funds, uh, funds outreach centers similar to this. So that uh, farmers, if they have a problem with their crop, they can uproot it and take it over here and to get a diagnosis. But oftentimes, these outreach centers are hours or maybe even days away from where the farmer is. And these farmers simply cannot afford to be losing that much time. So we decided, well, why can't we apply the same principle that we did with ophthalmology to this? And so we did. We made a modified device and gave it to a farmer. And we were taking pictures like this, and we were getting great accuracy. But the thing, the coolest thing that we can do with mobile technology is something I, I like to call disease tracking. So I want all of you to think that you're a farmer. And so let's say this side suddenly starts, their plants start to get a disease. Okay, so five or six of you start to uh, text the pictures of this to the outreach center, and they're like, hey, I've never seen nothing, anything like this. What is this? What am I supposed to do to solve this? Why is this hurting my yield so much? And the outreach center takes a look at it, and they're like, OK, well, uh, I know what this is, and this is what you do. Then a couple days later, someone over here sends the same thing. So now we suddenly have all these data points about how this disease is spreading. We're able to do something that we've never been able to do before. We're able to tell farmers when they're going to get hit by, a, by any sort of pesticide or virus. So like maybe next week, they, they realize it's coming over here, and they know that it's going from right to left. So I can warn you and say, hey, uh, you're about to get hit with this pest. You should probably put some of this on there so your yield doesn't get affected. Mobile technology has a power to do this. Now, unfortunately, my grandfather never got to see the healthcare system or the agriculture system put in his village. But Vikram and I are working very hard every day to make sure that one day both of these things will become a reality. Next time you take out your phone to take a cool picture of a car or any weird thing that you want to take a picture of, don't just think about the fact that it can do that. Also think about what else it could do. 
because a mobile phone has a lot more potential than just that. Thank you.